Um, I'm really excited about this training. I'm going to learn a lot. I'm sure I haven't heard everything. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of background about um, air pollution in our neighborhood and in the city to kind of give a grounding for why we're working on this. Um, so generally, air quality is better now than it was a while ago. So it's an upward trend. Um, so that's really good. But North, uh, North Brooklyn has air quality that is getting um, kind of better at a rate that's slower than the, than the average in New York City. Um, so that's kind of one reason we really want to make sure that you know some of the tools that we'll learn here today we can implement in our neighborhood. Um, so emission from fuel combustion directly um, produces particulate matter and indirectly produces ozone. Um, so those are two kinds of um, air pollution that I'll talk about a little bit more. And I also produced the uh, handout with all the things I wanted to tell you about air pollution probably didn't want to sit through, um, so you can kind of read that at your leisure. Um, so both of these um, uh, contribute to lung and heart issues. So in Williamsburg and Greenpoint, we actually have a lower asthma emergency department visit rate among children, 5 to 17, than the citywide rate, which is really good. Um, but when you look just a little bit further south, you're looking at the neighborhoods of Williamsburg and Bushwick. Um, it has some, it has air quality that's in like the lowest third. So definitely North Brooklyn is an area where we really need to focus on these kinds of things. Um, so in terms of particulate matter, North Brooklyn Neighbors has eight air quality monitors right now spread around the neighborhood. We're particularly looking to get more at East Williamsburg, so if anyone wants to host one, let me know. It is, we have a couple different kinds. just looks like this. You um, put it on the outside of your house. And it tells you what the particulate matter levels are. Um, so right now you can go online and take a look at any one of those monitors and kind of see what the air quality is like, um, which is really exciting to see it on a like more specific level because if you go um, to some of like weather.com, there's like one in Brooklyn rather than having it. I know you can tell right near the BQE what it looks like rather than a couple blocks away from Fuller Park, for example. Um, so ozone is the other kind of main um, air quality issue that um, relates to what we're talking about today. Um, and ozone is actually getting worse. So we're not talking about the ozone like the ozone layer. Um, this is ground level ozone. Um, and this happens when nitrous oxides and sunlight um, kind of mix together and it produces ozone, which is um, bad for the lungs. Have you guys heard of air quality action days or ozone action days. So that's usually related to ozone. Um, and basically they're saying if you have, um, you know, if you're susceptible to these kinds of things, you may not want to be exercising because then you'll be breathing it in more rapidly. Um, so with climate change, we're probably going to be getting even more ozone because with hotter temperatures, more ozone. So this is definitely something that's probably only going to continue to increase unless we really cut down on emissions. Um, so what can we do? First of all, you're here, so you guys have taken a really great first step. Um, I also want to say that maybe not everyone is going to want to fully do everything that we described tonight. There are other ways that you can take action, or you can do it in addition to the action that we're talking about tonight. Um, there's a number of bills in city council that we are actively monitoring and promoting. Um, one is the commercial waste zone bill, which makes it so um, you know, sanitation trucks that are picking up waste from restaurants or other commercial endeavors um, don't drive as many miles, basically. Um, we, North Brooklyn Neighbors, has also worked with um, Council Member 11 to, to work on three different bills, one of which makes environmental data public, another um, expands the definition of construction dust, and the last one is actually working to have air, air pollution violations work in a similar manner to what we're working on tonight where you can report it and possibly get some money from it as well. Um, the last one that I also want to introduce someone who's going to speak on it um, is Zero Emission School Buses by 2040 or sooner. Um, and I'm going to introduce Sarah D'Souza. Sarah is a community organizing intern at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. 
and she spent a lot of time observing school bus idling in East Harlem and Central Brooklyn. Um, she's going to talk about her experiences for a short while tonight. Just want to give you an idea. I know all of you are here because you've seen the idling is a problem, but just she's really into studying it, so she can talk a little about that right now. Thanks, Beth. Um, so over the summer, okay, over the summer I worked at NOPE doing community organizing in the environmental justice team. So I went out um, to a lot of EJ communities, environmental justice communities in East Harlem, East Flatbush, and different other parts of Brooklyn, and kind of focused my research on looking at different like bus routes. So we noted that there are a lot of bus depots scattered all across like EJ communities in New York City. But what happens is that they're catered to schools that are way outside of where they're actually located. So obviously, as those buses are going through their routes every day and driving 13 miles or so outside of that, they're polluting the air as they go along. Um, and obviously, air pollution is something that affects like different sorts of health risks, including like asthma, it's also like carcinogen and other things like that, and especially affects special needs students more so. Um, so I spent a lot of the summer like looking at those bus routes as well as also tracking buses. So I went out to various communities and looked to see how long buses were idling outside of schools and found a 95% idling rate um, for more than a minute. And so um, as I think Tep is going to speak more about like how you can report idling, but the law says that you're not supposed to, if you have no passengers in the school bus, you're not supposed to be idling more than one minute. Um, so if you go and you look and observe, you'll see that buses get there like 20 minutes before and drop off, up before the end of the school day, and then also stay another like 20 to 40 minutes after, waiting for students and also running the AC, and then there are a lot more diesel buses that are operating on the streets right now than gas buses, so diesel is worse for the environment. So that's kind of what I did over the summer, uh, just to give you a sense of how school buses specifically contribute to idling in the city, um, and then technically speak more to how um, other buses like commercial vehicles are also contributing to that. So on to the idling section. Um, so I believe it's section 24-163 uh, of the administrative code that deals with idling. Um, so local law 717A, um, which George will be able to tell you a lot about, um, allows for citizens to receive 25% of the imposed fine when it's submitted through the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and one of the sponsors of that law was Antonio Reynoso, whose district we're in right now. Um, so we're going to have two experts really talk to you about it today. They've done a lot of work. Um, I'm going to introduce them now and then I'll let them take it from here. Um, so George Packingham was instrumental in the passage of Bill 717A, which allows citizens to provide evidence on idling trucks and buses. His efforts have been highlighted by The New Yorker, the BBC, NPR, among others, and he has produced six short films, two novels, and a children's book. His fight against idling in New York City is documented in his film, Idle Threat, A Man on a Mission, which is from 2012 and can be viewed on YouTube. He has also been one of the most active users of the legislation and has accrued more than $13,000 so far. Um, and over here we have Kevin Grant, who is a father and an electric car enthusiast. He founded the Electric School Bus Campaign after repeatedly experiencing diesel emissions from school buses. Um, and was also influenced from the fallout from the Volkswagen scandal. Um, by day, he is an environmental attorney and is the president of Green Apple Transport, working to build the nation's first all-electric school bus company. Um, so I'm going to let them take it from here, and thank you both for uh, everything you're going to tell us. Uh, how many people have seen Idle Threat? Oh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <coughs> It's now free on YouTube, by the way. So it's Idle Threat Channel. So if you haven't seen it, go there and it costs you a penny. Um, in short, it tells the story of my 12 of my five years doing a statistical study and analysis of the island problem here in New York City, where buses and trucks and cars were likely given a 1971 law that forbids it. And I came upon this law in 2006 and saw this crazy situation. 
which was revolting to me. And I wanted to do something about it. So I studied it and, and learned the intricacies of it and began, as a, as a citizen, as you saw in the film, going up to people that were idling and rapping on the window and asking them to shut their engine off, and I was 80% successful. And I said, who can be 80% successful in anything? But I was 80% successful. A lot of my colleague in the, in the back, I showed him a demo to a documentary film right about the same time I started it, and he thought it was hilarious, the demo of me walking to people. But I didn't intend it to be funny. But one thing led to another, I completed the film. In 2012, it was shown at the Woodstock Film Festival as in a world premiere. Um, later on, several more film festivals had it. And it was well received, let's put it that way. However, uh, I was some, about two years after that, I was summoned to city council to testify on a, on a minute idling issue. And I bought a copy of the film. And I gave it to one of the key people on city council that deals with eco issues. And this person said, the next week we started to discuss it on the phone, she goes, I love the film. It was right on the money, and we agreed to have coffee. So we had coffee. She says, it's time for a citizen's air complaint component to the law, because the, the police aren't enforcing it. And I said, well, what does that mean? She goes, I envision a $350 fine, and the citizen gets 50% for submitting the proper evidence to the DEP. I went, that's something I want to talk about. So it took me four months to sit in front of my uh, council person, Helen Rosenthal, on the Upper West Side. Four months. We sat, I presented a 12 page PowerPoint to her about how to put this whole thing together. And page four, she goes, Stop, you had me at page one. I, I'll do what I need to do to make this bill happen. And I was blown away. Six months later, the steps of City Hall, the bill was introduced. Three years, at least three years later, it was voted upon at City Council with a vote of 47 to 3 in favor of the bill. It became effective about 18 months ago. First year statistics, as I know them, correct me if I'm wrong, about 1,200 files were submitted. And correct me again, to date, this year, about 6,100 files have been, have been submitted. Well, it's hard to know how many the actual numbers are, but it has been a huge increase. We've had at least double or triple the amount of people filing complaints, and I don't even know if they know the exact numbers because we transitioned to the electronic system from the right. um, handwritten submissions, but yeah. there has been a huge increase, and there's still a lot of room for more increase, and that's why we're here in Brooklyn, and, and we'll get to that. Yep, yeah. and, and that's why you're here, because I think you're hungry to learn more about the, the nuance of this whole thing, and, and some techniques to how to how to be efficient, how to be subtle, not overt in being you know in doing what you're doing, but keeping it on the on the quiet side, but yet being very effective and efficient in gathering information as needed. So I just utilized a lot of time here. If you want to step in, right. sure. tell them what your great work is all about. Yeah. So um, I kind of fell into the idling law. Um, I started with um, school buses. I went to a play with my daughter. And I mean, most of you probably see one or two school buses in the neighborhood. We walked to school. We didn't even actually see the school buses that dropped kids off. They dropped them off on the other side of the school. And they came a little early. But I came out, and there was a sea of school buses from other schools and her school. And I could smell the air. I mean, everyone I talked to, the first thing you remember about riding on the school bus is the noise and the smell of the school buses. And that's pollution. That's just straight pollution. I mean, studies from 20 years ago show that on school buses, the pollution can be 20 to 30 times higher than outside the school bus. So we're putting our kids in gas chambers to take them to school. And I've been in environmental law. I've known about diesel. And this all went over my head until that fateful day that I came out and I saw what was going on. Um, so I've been into cars all my life. And I knew the electric car revolution was finally here. Um, this time, and I was like, what's going on with large trucks and school buses? I mean, they have a perfect use case. Everybody worries about mileage of electric cars, where to charge them. You're not taking a school bus on a five-state trip. They go 20 to 30 miles a day, two hours in the morning, two hours at night. They're all parked in the same yard every night. Some park on the street. Um, I know coming here through Brooklyn, you can see a lot of the school buses parked on the street or parked between houses. 
but you know where they are. Um, they have very short use, they have plenty of downtime to charge. So I was like, this is the perfect vehicle. Their emissions are horrible. In New York State, or New York City, they allow school buses to run for 16 years, and they don't have to be any cleaner than the day that they were built. So your child could ride the same school bus from day one until they graduate and go to college. Think about that. I mean, and those emissions do not have to get any cleaner. And you have to worry about the school bus maintenance and all of that in order to keep those emissions up. From day one, it's just getting worse. Um, so knowing all of this, I was like, what can I do? How can I affect that? And being a lawyer, I was like, let's make a law. Let's make this happen. And I haven't quite been as successful as Packingham, but I haven't been at it as long. So um, about two years ago, I found Daniel Jerome. He had a small bill that he introduced that had like two or three co-sponsors that talked about retiring school buses instead of 16 years to 10 years, and talking about hybrid and diesel and electric. And I was like, we can make this stronger, we can make this better. And um, I've talked to city council, and it's, it's been going along. And they have a bill, we talked last December when they had a large meeting, and we have now have 43 sponsors, but still nine months later, they haven't voted on the bill. I am bugging them every day on Twitter, and I need your help. I need you guys to follow me and retweet and like. Um, my, our email address is on the bottom, our website's on the bottom of the handout, um, Evolve Electric, and there was a link to our Twitter. Please follow and um, Bug your council members to get this bill passed. But um, the, the bus bill is in the same section as the idling law. Um, so I was, as a lawyer, I was like, curious to see the citizen component. I was like, oh, this could be fun. So I've, I've been helping George kind of push the envelope and figure out what's good evidence, how to submit the proper case, how to make it stronger, and um, help the city get the proper evidence to file a complaint. And that's what we're here to teach you today. Um, it's just a, sh you know, it's a short video and some documentation that you have to submit, but it's crucial that you get it right because if you don't, the judges will kick it out. And if we don't get meaningful enforcement, then uh, there's no point in the companies will not listen and start to actually um, tell their drivers to shut the engine off. Uh, we have had some success, but about 90% of all the cases that are filed are in Manhattan. So there's very little action in Queens and Brooklyn, Staten Island and the Bronx, and those areas are um, quite bad for pollution. There are stats that say areas in North Brooklyn, Harlem, and the Bronx, one in four kids have some form of asthma. And these are the kids that are riding in school buses. So it's getting exacerbated. New York City is the only place in the state that is still out of compliance for non submissions um, We're in a non-attainment area. So, I mean, because our density is so strong, even though we don't have the hills like California to block the air, because our density is so high, the pollution still accumulates. We have about 50 school buses for every square mile in New York City. New York City is the <coughs> largest school district with the most amount of school buses. We would be a top 10 state on our own. We have about over 10 to 12,000 school buses operating daily. School buses carry more children every day than all commercial airplane flights. Um, so, I mean, there's a real situation that we can make a real difference on global warming, your local environment, and all of that. Um, so now I guess we should probably get into what you need to do to become an idle warrior and get out of there and um, make some money. Um, as we said, you get about 25% of um, of the settlement, which generally is about eighty-seven fifty, I like to tell people it's a fourteen dollar an hour job. Um, so it's it's not it's pretty decent money, but you could uh, the highest single check I've seen was about three hundred and thirty dollars. I'm sure George probably had higher six fifty for one check. <laughs> so that's you know. Um, so the law basically states that you can't idle for more than three minutes um, for a commercial vehicle. So what you need to do is document the vehicle idling. The important aspect of that is to get um, the audio. You have to be able to clearly hear, hear, hear the vehicle idling for at least three minutes and one second. And what we use, what most people use who have been doing this is an app. Uh, time, you can look on your phone, timestamp time camera or anything with a time code camera. 
um, download an app that will record on top of the, the um, video the time as you're recording it. So time and date. Time, yeah, time and date stamp. Um, and, and location. Location is important. I I tell I've been back and forth on whether I use the location app because in some places in New York City the GPS yeah. is a little squirrely and the judges are very keen on throwing cases out for improper location. A lot of these guys will come in with GPS because a lot of their trucks are tracked and say that the truck was somewhere else. So it's very important to document the location. Um, that, can, that can be done with stills um, afterwards. Um, and you, we use both video and still photographs because the courts currently do not accept video. The videos do get played at court, but it's not kept as part of the record. So we get stills to be able to identify the vehicle. So um, most commercial trucks have the name, usually the address and um, a US DOT number on the side of the door. If you want to get a clear photograph of that, you need a clear photograph of the license plate to identify the specific vehicle. And um, I also try to get a clear picture of the location. Usually from across the street, you can get a picture showing the vehicle and the store behind the vehicle. I take a picture of the, um, the, the door sign with the number of the address. I usually do a pan as, well, I usually start recording coming up to the vehicle and record come going away from it so you can see the area um, on the video so it shows where you are and you'll be able, when you go back to write the complaint, you'll be able to identify more accurately where the, where the location of the vehicle is. Sometimes I even use a Google map image. Um, you can do a cut and paste. Um, and we're also working on making an online tutorial where we'll walk through all of the steps from signing up online, taking a video, filling out the complaint, um, and that will be attached to our website. Um, so you can go and get a refresher if you have any questions. We also have a Google group, um, Idle Warriors, New York City Idle Warriors, where if you have specific questions, you can ask us um, and we'll try to answer. And it's, it's a forum so everybody can talk together, share tips, how to record. Um, but those are the basics of what you need. There are some nuances like a bus, a commercial bus, it needs to have at least 15 seats, which in most cases negates accessoride, which is a pet peeve of mine. I really want to get um, accessoride vehicles. Um, even though it's a state agency, the actual owners of the truck are independent companies, they're subcontractors. And that's um, one of the important reasons why I try to get a US DOT number if it's available because that tells you who the owner of the vehicle is. But sometimes, a lot of the like, commercial buses will have one name as the transit company, but the actual operator of the bus is something else. And school buses do that a lot also. A lot of the school bus companies, they have five or six different names um, on the school bus, but the operator um, is someone else. Like Grandpa has at least four or five different school bus companies. l and has a bunch of school bus companies and they split up the contracts to make them not look as large. Um, and if you are recording at schools, which I do encourage, probably don't record at the school that you have a kid at. Um, that's, that's important. Um, and you know, record when the kids aren't going on or on the bus. As it, as it was stated earlier, these buses usually come 20 or 30 minutes before pickup, and they sit at idle, and they won't have any passengers on the bus. So it's easy, and in front of schools, you only need one minute. You need more, well, more than one minute. It always has to be more than, more than three minutes or more than one minute. If you have two minutes and 59 seconds, the judge will kick it out. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. You have to have more than three minutes. Um, I've seen a lot of cases thrown out on their face because they say, I leave from 3 o'clock to 3.03. That's three minutes. That doesn't prove it's been more than three minutes. Um, so I usually have a roll of film of about four to five minutes of the total recording, um, at least three minutes of clear audio. Um, so, yeah, you want to make sure you document the video well. Um, there are lots of different techniques. I would start with a friend or someone so that you don't look as obvious, you don't want to be out there. Hey, I'm recording a vehicle. I um, think, you know, if you go out with someone else, you can act like you're talking. You know, pretend like you're reading a book and you just have your phone in your hand 
and you know, you, I would practice at home, trying to figure out ways to record on the slide, put like a water bottle on the table, and try to record it as you walk through the room, try to keep the camera aimed on it. Um, take a little, you know, it's, it's, uh, it can be fun, and you do get a little bit of an adrenaline rush at about the two minute and 30 second mark. <laughs> And it's surprising. And it, there's a little perverseness in, in it, because you're like, I don't want to see the vehicle idling. But then when you do, you're like, yes, I'm going to get you. <laughs> um, and I usually, at the end of the videos, I usually tell the driver, you know, it's not good to idle. And most of them do shut off the vehicle, I'm sure. Uh, George can tell you more interesting stories. You do get some confrontations. I do not encourage anyone to confront anyone. Don't need to do it. I found plenty of vehicles idling with no driver. I mean, probably a good 30% of the vehicles I've recorded have no one in the vehicle. They're either off point their delivery, or they're in the back, they're going to get lunch, whatever. So there are plenty of vehicles. I mean, the first couple of vehicles, I would just look for, you know, empty vehicles. You want to look for box trucks that don't have a refrigeration unit, because that is one of the exemptions, um, if they have a refrigeration unit to keep food cold or whatever, they can idle if the engine is powering the refrigeration unit, if it's powering some kind of loading or unloading equipment, or um, any kind of mechanism like a dump truck, which they have a lift or a cement mixer. You have a question? So you're talking about um, the differences in trucks here. So a yes. box truck would be different than a tractor trailer truck. Right, tractor trailers are also good. They're very easy. Well, track, so yeah. my issue, and I'm going to bring up a question, is yes. that generally the track the trailer, the trailer park is independent, from the refrigeration unit is independent yes. of the actual tractor. Right. So we get it twofold. We get the truck idling, and we have the refrigeration unit running. But to my knowledge, the tractor part of it is not powering um, the trailer yeah. park. A box truck may be different. Yeah, there are some box trucks that have independent um, idling, and I have, um, and that, those, those are for more experienced, um, that's when you get more experience, but the tractor trailers are pretty easy. You can get to the front of the truck, you can hear that the engine is clearly idling, and you can walk by the truck so that they can hear the difference between the front of the truck and maybe the refrigeration unit. Yeah, the refrigeration unit is generally mounted on the front of the trailer, yeah. above the cab of the tractor. Yeah. But the huge so you get both. I mean, it's yeah. just, yeah. Yeah, sometimes they have both on, sometimes it's just the, the well, cab. Well, they, they usually cycle, the refrigeration units usually cycle. They'll run for five or ten minutes and then be off for a few minutes and then come back on. All right. That's what I've seen. Yeah, so. And the truck's just completely out of the most, in right. my case, if you want to put Yeah, so if you if you have a location um, that you know is good, then tractor trailers, <laughs> yeah, so you'll be, you'll be breaking the new up. Tractor trailers are, are very good. They're one of the easy targets. Um, you know, a lot of these guys will have layovers. I have a Costco near me, and they just line up, and every day going to work, I get two or three, and you know, on my way to work, it's, it gets very easy. Um, but yeah, you can, as long as you clearly identify that it is the engine of the vehicle, um, you're good to go. And, and just one other question, with yeah. the location, street signs? Work? Yeah, I, if it's near a corner, I definitely try to pan around and say I'm at the corner of you know, Lafayette and John, or whatever. Whatever. Um, as long as you can properly locate the truck, I usually go from the truck to some identifying mark or street address. Street address, and you can say this is where they are. Because that will be one of the main challenges that um, that you'll get. Any question? Yeah. After you submit your complaint, I assume you don't have to show up anywhere. You just get an email, or you do get an email as to if they accept it, because DP does have the right to reject your submissions. Um, and if one of the categories, like a city vehicle, is not um, not going to be found guilty of idling, there are two um, what is it, armored truck companies that have gotten exemptions for idling, um, but I don't think they write to any of the armored truck companies. Um, and there are a few other um, areas that they won't issue a ticket for. It does give you the ability to then write the ticket on your own, and you can get 50% of the fine in those cases. I I feel that it's not going to be worth the effort unless it's somebody that's like in your neighborhood and they are really you know idling outside your window or near your playground or something, and you really want them to stop because it's not going to be worth the time and effort to file it yourself. You're going to have to show up in court. 
which is at least three or four hours of your day, you probably have to take off work. You're going to have to get um, a ticket from the city, and then you're going to have to write it yourself. You're going to have to submit it to the company, make sure it's served properly, um, which could cost you money if you have to use a process server and um, all that information. So it's best to get things that will be accepted. It's a lot easier. It's a lot more efficient. You'll make a lot more um, money on those so, cases. So you're saying yeah. that if you submit through the DEP using yeah. this process, you probably won't have to go into court. But if you're willing to do it on your own to get a higher percentage of fine, then you you probably will have to go into court. You'll definitely have to. Go. Yeah. You're going to get your tickets going to get thrown out if you don't show. Okay. That's that's for sure. The judge is going to be like, well, no one's appearing, um, and they'll they'll most they'll throw it out. Um, the, the, these cases are not seen too favorably because they do know that citizens are making money. So if, they're, if it looks like you're in it for the money um, or you know, you're for some kind of vendetta, a lot of judges may look frown upon that. Um, so they do scrutinize the evidence. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if you brought, wrote a case by yourself and you didn't show it, most likely you're gonna throw, be thrown out. And sometimes the does call you in to testify on, on a case. Okay. And then just yeah. to follow up with the first option for the uh, accepted uh, like yeah. face value, does it take like weeks or months? <laughs> You've never been to court. <laughs> um, since we've gone to online, I've submitted uh, some back in June, and they're scheduled for January for the first hearing. And some haven't even been written yet. And those will most likely get adjourned at least once for another two or three months. And then they have to be found in violation. And then they have to pay the ticket. And then eventually you'll have to write oath to tell them that you wanted the ticket was paid. And then you'll get a check in the mail. So it's, I would say, at least seven, eight months before the first check. Um, but once they do start coming in, they'll be consistent. And but the comptroller has been pretty fast. Pretty good. And, um, and issuing the checks. Um, so uh, before I do, there was a question over here. Yeah. Uh, what court hears the checks? These are all administrative hearings. Um, so they're heard at Hope, um, the Office of Trials and Hearings, and they're all heard in Manhattan, um, Lower John Street, um, downtown Manhattan. Um, you could actually, I mean, if you knew there was a case, you could go to any old office and go in and sit in on cases. Um, it's open to the public. Uh, you could appear on your own cases just to see what's happening and how it's going on. Um, I encourage everyone to go to court. It's fun. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Not for your own cases if you're losing. But, um, it's fun to see the legal system at work. I mean, I guess I'm a lawyer, so of course that's uh, fun to do. Just like deep diving into the law. And um, if, you, if you make it to the videos where I go and dissect the statute, You'll be, be ready, get some popcorn, come to the drink, get a little brandy. Um, I'll probably be doing a deep dive in that. Um, but there'll be a lot of information, a lot of good information. And that, um, before I forget, um, so the key thing on this that for everyone that I have to give a warning, when you're doing this, this information is public. This is going to be public records. Once you turn it over, it's DEP records. It's, oath, it's court records. The person who you're filing against can request the records. You can request the records. You can go to oath and say, give me the, everything you have on a certain case, and they will turn it over. So um, I use a PO box. I know a few other people use PO boxes to, as their address, their mailing address. You can do that. You can use a work phone or any other phone number um, when you're submitting for this. Um, I would not use my home address just because. Um, like a, um, early on when I was filing, one day I came home and a newspaper reporter was outside and said, hey, I'd like to interview you about I uh, I was like, ah, oh, that's interesting. So you, you can still get paid even if you don't just give them your um, full name and work address, for example? Yes, they, they will mail it to any legal address. Then that but the be, checks are not like, specified to your address? No, they, they'll have your name on it. So. Okay. Your bank will catch it as long as it's your name and endorsed. Um, but that is something that I, I try to tell anyone that's looking to get into this, is that the information will be public. I mean, I, I'm not worried about you know retaliation from these people. It's 
it is a, it is, can be a hefty fine. Three hundred fifty dollars is not anything, but it's to the company. It's not to the driver. All these violations are issued to the companies. Uh, it's a cost of doing business for them, um, and I haven't had any, you know, negative interactions from the drivers. Most of them will ask me if I'm a cop or something, or they'll just say they'll turn off their engine, um, or they'll just watch me if they even notice I'm there. Most of them are reading or eating or doing something else if they're in the truck. Um, most of the time, they don't even know I'm recording them. So there's areas in the neighborhood in Greenpoint where there are private carting trucks yes. lined up. Yeah. They run their engines with, you know, I don't know how long. Yeah. As long as I, as long as they can pass it from one side of the neighborhood to the other. Um, if they're carting trucks, uh, they have the electric, they have like the, the electric lift. Yes. So are they, they're, they're not city trucks, they're private companies. Mm -hmm. Can they be videotaking fine under this? As long as they're not actively using the loader, even though I have um, I have seen trucks that I mean the lift gate is not necessarily tied to the engine. Um, I have um, caught some trucks where I will see them operating the lift gate without the engine on, and then catch them idling. So those I'm pretty confident of because I can put the two videos together, and it'll show that they do not need the engine to run the lift gate. Um, that takes a little bit of a nuance. Um, and learning which you know air conditioning units can run independently because there are certain models that they have their own engine and you'll some of them you'll see they'll have a little smokestack uh, coming out of the top so they have their own power source so even if they're both running they don't need the engine to run the refrigeration unit and as you start uh, doing some of these trucks and I'm going to have posting videos on different vehicles that I've caught and um, you know you can watch those and you'll kind of you'll learn which ones are good, which ones are bad. Uh, but there are a lot of easy fish out there to, to start with. That's okay. That being said, is it possible to think about a couple of worse actors in our neighborhood yeah. you know, that are just lined up in a line? Is it possible to get more than one idling drunk on the same video? It's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, I was at a juice press location that had five of their trucks outside. Um, and I did two videos of two trucks at the same time, they were parked next to each other, could have the independent license plates. I went up to each one, the engines were on. None of these trucks had drivers in them. Right. They were just sitting there. So I was I'm fairly confident I can win those because there is no, once I, I start the video and show that each truck is on and I can show the cab and no one gets in or out of the truck, there's no way to turn off the vehicle and I go back and show that the vehicles are still on. Um, you have to submit those independently. Um, but yeah, it, can, it would be tricky to get multiple vehicles. In some cases it can be done, but in general you want to have one vehicle, one reporting, just to make it easier for the judge to um, decide in your favor. Because you know, some will say traffic noise or whatever um, makes it hard to determine whether or not the vehicle is on. Obviously the ones with no drivers are the, are the easiest. You can go across the street, get comfortable, and get a good you know, full span of the truck. Are there any stipulations on um, location? So like using your example for Costco, if you were in the Costco parking lot and you saw people idling, would that, or does it have to be? Yeah, any, anywhere is, is um, okay to get It could them. be like private property. Like yeah, Costco. yeah. And the only thing about location is if it's adjacent to a school, which means the four roads that uh, a school block is, mm -hmm. that is one minute. So. If you're there, you know, if the school is on the top of the block and they're on the bottom, it's still considered adjacent to a school, as long as it's on this, so that same block. And it's one minute, but you do have to identify the school. You have to do, you do and as part of your submission, you do have to identify the school, or else you can't prove that they were adjacent to a school. And um, I usually record those for three minutes anyway, just because then even if they say, well, I was next to the school, well, I've still got you for three minutes, I think. Um, so that kind of covers the basis there. But um, yeah, there's no restriction on location. I mean, obviously, it's like a construction yard or something. I would go walking into um, to an area that for a fenced off you know, building. But Costco is public. I mean, there's a public parking lot where you can get access. I wouldn't go on the private property to 
that somebody I like um, is not worth it. This is the viewer. I was thinking of construction issues because the neighborhood we're in, like rampant construction, we have trucks lining up ready to <laughs> they're, they're, take out dirt. Yeah, they're ready. Um, Those guys are good. I love so them. I, I'm a little confused on which trucks we can talk about. So cement mixers, we can't. Cement mixers are hard because they do have to run the drum in order for the cement not to, um, to solidify. But they have um, semis that are delivering I beams or concrete or windows. They'll be idling the dump trucks or that are collecting the dirt or moving the, uh, bringing dirt or whatever material. As long as they're not using the the bed, if it's just sitting there and idling, waiting to go into the yard, they're they're open. Is it your experience that's just the price of doing business because we have oh, yeah. 12, 12 trucks lined up ready? Well, um, one, it's price of doing business, and two, it's lack of enforcement. Um, before George got involved, um, I, I mean, you can probably better tell the stats, but there were a few hundred idling cases a year, and that's all that, all that were being done. I mean, the agencies weren't really enforcing them, the police can enforce it, DV can enforce it, sanitation can enforce it, anyone that can write a ticket can enforce it, the DOT can enforce it, but it just was not being enforced. Um, so a lot of companies, it didn't matter because that wasn't something that was on their radar. Um, they know about the law and most drivers say, oh yeah, I've heard about the IV law. Uh, but a lot of them don't realize that citizens can, can, can uh, submit violations. That's kind of new, it's probably been three or four years. No, no, uh, February 18, 2018 was the first time. I thought you were submitting like 2016 or something. No, no, just but, for violations. Well, they, to, to segue, um, I was given permission in 2016 to do a test by the DEP. And um, because this was a novel idea, and it hadn't been passed by city council, but I was permitted a test. And I gave 20 files. I did 22 files, mostly on buses. <laughs> number. And by the way, this is buses and trucks only. It's not passenger cars. Yeah. You um, can't get your neighbor. Yeah. Keep your neighbor alone. <laughs> Unless they own a commercial vehicle. <laughs> and and uh, I, I submitted those 20 test files to the EP. And they all came back rejected for insufficient evidence. And I went, what? What's going on? They give me permission to do it, and they, they pull it right away from me. They said, if you want to go to court yourself, you can do that. And I didn't know how to go to court. So I was in the position of going, am I going to figure this thing out in court? Or am I going to put my tail between my legs and run away? And I said, no, I'm going to figure it out in court. So I went down to both court and spoke to some people. And they said, well, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. I went to court this December uh, 4th, 19, uh, 2017, I think it was. And I had four cases that I won all four cases. Yeah, so just by being a stubborn master, you know, I pushed it. I pushed it through, and three months later, I got check. I had all seven checks in one day came to me, and it was like Christmas in March. <laughs> Whoa, five hundred bucks a year, five hundred a year. I got fifty percent because I went and did it myself, and that and you can still do that yourself. Though I wouldn't recommend it. I, the best thing is to, is to submit a solid file to the DEP. Uh, and, and by the way, in the back, I, ha I, I have some uh, handouts and giveaways. Uh, frequently asked questions. It's, we're gonna, still going to go through a lot, but there's frequently asked questions and this page can be taken in the back. And also, uh, a quick field guide. Yeah, they made a one, one page. Okay, so, so that's there. And, and there's some other things back there. To log in to, to, log in to where DEP. Is, has its site located so you know how to log in and fill out the forms. A sample of the affidavit, because currently uh, an affidavit has to go along with this, and it's a sample of that I'm going to hand out. Um, a sample letter to the, to the oath court saying, I have submitted you five files and they're all paid in full, now pay me. I have a sample letter for you for that, which is critical. Uh, a sample check, what the check looks like, that you get paid. And special prize for someone who can tell me who this is. 
Time Magazine cover. Greta? Do I hear Greta? It's Greta. As you may or may not know, she was on the cover of Time Magazine. Does everyone know who Greta Thunberg is? Okay. Yeah. So she's in town right now for the, for the big meeting that took place in the United, United Nations. And by the way, I have another special prize. Five years ago, there was a march for uh, Earth Justice from Columbus Circle to the Javits Center of people from all over the country marching and demanding that politicians pay attention to eco-justice issues. If someone can tell me how many people marched that day, they get a special prize. <laughs> how many people marched that day? Huh? Throw some numbers out. 400,000. But you're close. And, and if you want to come up here and, and, and you photograph with this gas mask on, standing next to Devin right here, we'll be happy to arrange that for you. Hopefully we won't need gas masks. That's why we're here tonight. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you did bring up a, um, I'm going to have, um, on the website, we'll have fillable forms of the affidavit, and I'll have, um, out of the complaints, sample complaints, what you need to have in the complaint and how to write it out, because um, there are some, it's going to kind of be pro forma, so you can just fill out all the key information for your specific case, um, you know, the location, make sure you have all the information, the date, time, and, um, one thing that's kind of come up through the cases is they want to know how you recorded it, so like, you know, model of your cell phone or whatever you're using. Um, so we'll have all that information for you. Uh, speaking of recording, and perhaps yeah. I'm just jumping the gun, but yeah. uh, um, what is, um, how large can the file be that you submit, and uh, can you talk more about yeah. that? Because often, especially if you record five minutes, that could be a huge file. Yes. And, um, Currently, I mean, when we started, um, they were allowing 25 megabytes, um, which is nothing. I mean, that's a few pictures. Um, now they've gone up to 100 megabytes. Um, you can submit multiple videos or pieces of video in sections, but um, I'll have a link and I'll, I'll do a video on how to, we have a, a compression app that will compress your videos and um, they'll get it under 100 megabytes and it still be about 720 or 480p, which is pretty good resolution, and it'll still have solid audio, which is the most important, is getting the audio. Um, so there, you, can, you can compress the videos, but yeah, they do have a 100 megabyte um, limit, and I think they take up to four, four, um, four different files. So you can either break up the video and submit it that way. Um, you do also have to submit the complaint, which um, has the complaint, I also add the photographs with a description um, where needed. I usually have a printout from um, the US DOT registry which shows you the legal name and the address that they accept for service and all that stuff. And um, that stuff will be managed in the tutorial and we'll have links on the website showing you off where you can get all that information. Links to the Department of State, which also gives you address. But some just have a, a name on the side of the truck and they're like, well, where do I serve this? I know um, Con Ed has been an issue um, that's come up. Um, it's for Irving, but on certain, looking at certain documents, it'll give you like a yard or wherever where the trunk came out of, which is not their proper place of service. So it is, that's, um, it's very important to get the right address for, um, for service. Yeah, I guess I just want a little bit of clarity because I'm learning this for the first time also. Yeah. Um, so you talk a little bit about an affidavit and you talk about citizens' complaint. Can you just go through like exactly start to what? Finish. Yeah, how you do it, and what you need. And yeah. Well, I mean, you start with a video. That's the that's the first. Thing. You have to find a perf. So, so <laughs> this, is, this is the only tool that you need on the job to create the file. Yeah. It's pretty darn amazing. Yeah. I mean, most of the t most of the videos that I I mean, I don't looking for them specifically. I mean, I get them before I go as I'm walking to work. I get them on my lunch break, after work. You know, it's and I can still get ten or fifteen in a week. He goes looking um, for them. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I keep my ears open. I keep my ears open, and I do have circuits that I'll walk, get my steps in. Um, you know, <laughs> Get healthy as you're trying to clean up the environment. As long as you're not choking on the pollution. Yeah. 
sometimes you, you get away from the trucks and you're like, this is why I'm doing this. That's right. Um, yeah. they, can, they can get pretty bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, you don't really have to go out of your way. I mean, a lot of you have already said you know, you know where you're going tomorrow. You know, you know in your neighborhood where these trucks occupy. Construction sites, you know, where, the, um, where you find a lot of stores, where they're doing deliveries. Schools, unfortunately, um, are a good location. You go, you know, half an hour before pick the truck uh, at the school. You'll probably find a couple school buses lined up by the as the drivers are talking to each other or whatever. There are lots of easy locations, um, and you'll you know your neighborhoods. You know where these trucks are located. Yeah. Did, you, did you say before go to the school that you have kids at? Don't don't go to the school. Don't go to the, don't yeah, you don't want it's the teachers or the or the bus because they're going to know. That someone is reporting them there, and you, the last thing you want is a confrontation with a bus driver or something in front of the school, or them knowing where your kids are. Um, I mean, that's just safety. Um, I mean, there's schools everywhere. There's schools there where I work, so I go by those schools. I, I don't, I don't feel outside of my kids. I hate it because I see it and I'm like, oh, I want to get you, but um, you know, it's just a precaution. I mean. Well, I don't really expect anything to happen, but why risk it? You know, why bring trouble home? Um, so when you use a PO box, yeah. do you use your name? Yes, do you, you have fill, to use your legal name. Do you name. fill out like an I-9, income? Do you um, use your social? Do you get yeah, that? there are there are tax implications. I mean, I would definitely I keep a spreadsheet of all of the cases I write and when I get the checks and um, submit that um, as income. It is income. Um, I put away, you know, about half of the checks just in case to cover taxes, and then next year it's, you know, it's free and clear. But you, you don't want to not get a knocking up on the court saying we have paid you five thousand dollars. Yeah, you're not giving that. That's not mailed to you. Yeah. yeah. So you got, it's up to your own discretion. Yeah. But if if you're doing more than five or six, yeah, I mean, you're going to be getting a significant amount of money. The last thing you want is an IRS looking at you. Right. Come on. <laughs> and the website that you're mentioning, what website is that that you're putting out tutorials? Oh, um, our Evolve Electric. Uh, it's on the bottom of the flyer. Um, wow. Go to the Idling, Evolve Electric. Uh, you go to the Idling page, and um, we're, we're, we're filling that out with. Um, is that on one of these? Yeah, it, oh, it's on the little, the little half like page little flyer. It's a little quarter sheet that you can put in your wallet, um, and it's on the bottom of that. If you Yes, we'll have links to all of the websites that you need to visit, and um, we'll be filling out the tutorials. Yes. Good question. How do you make your video? Do you need to have you know three minutes of you know of the tractor running, and then you do the running, or can you do you know start running, do the you know running, and go back to the tractor, or do you really need to have three minutes? Continuous. You have to have a, at least more than three minutes continuous of the vehicle. Uh, I like on the vehicle. Yes. You have to remain on the vehicle for three minutes. You can't pan around. You, it's the audio that's the most important. Uh, but I mean, you can pan around a little bit. But I generally try to stay on the vehicle. Got a question? Do you have to narrate the video? You don't have to, but <laughs> if possible, I usually narrate at the end after oh. I've already gotten the three minutes. Because it's good, because now you have a way to testify that they can't dispute. Because you know you're there, you're taking, doing it at the time. It's permanent part of the record because it's on the video, so you can describe that you didn't see them loading or unloading a vehicle. You can describe the location, like you said. Yeah. You can read the DOT number and stuff in case maybe you didn't get that great shot of the of, um, of the license plate or the name of the company. So narrating it is good, especially if, like, oh, the driver just left the vehicle. Right. I mean, that's, you know, that's good. So um, if you can't get some narration on there, it's good. Um, depending on what techniques you're using to record, it may look natural that you're narrating. Um, I like to use, I mean, it's harder to do the landscape. Um, portrait is easier to hide, but you get a lower quality video because it's a narrow field of view. So it's hard to show the whole vehicle with a portrait. I, I prefer the landscape. I mean, it is an HD world, um, but just for but it it does become a little more challenging. But as I said, you know, if you 
you work on where you're recording, when you're recording, you can have techniques that make you look obvious that you're not doing anything. I mean, I've just sat down, you know, and had put the phone down next to me and have it recording. Um, so, you, you know, you work with what you have, what your location is, to try to, you know, you want to be blend in to the surroundings. I mean, we had one guy who, he was after um, these buses that, um, these transit buses that took people to the airport or whatever. So he got a suitcase, you know, he was packed and ready, and he was out there recording, and he just kept nailing all of these buses because he was just waiting for the next bus. I got my package, I'm eating my croissant, you know, I'm waiting for my bus to show up. And he'd just stand there, he'd get their schedule, and he'd be there for a couple hours, get a couple buses. He'd just be that, another pet tourist with a suitcase recording. Um, yes. A little bit broader, but has there been any conversation about a program like this being expanded to uh, cars and trucks blocking bike lanes or trucks on no through truck routes or kind of some of these other areas that folks in the neighborhood have a lot of issues with and have had issues with throughout the city? Um, That's where you guys come in. I mean, just like George had his issue and I have my issue with school buses, you know, we got a bill, we got bills noticed and they're working their way through the, the system. I mean, one person really can make a difference. If you care about that one issue, you learn about it, you know it, and you go to your local you know, person, and you have you know, North Brooklyn neighbors that can help you get into contact with who you need to. This is your neighborhood. Um, you have other groups. I mean, other groups will have large campaigns that encompass this issue. I mean, I know bike riding. I've, on Twitter, I've met a lot of people you know, biking is a huge issue all over the nation. Um, we've had a lot of accidents this year with bikers. Um, so it is something that um, people are thinking about. So, you know, yeah. we, we want to expand, I mean, it would be great to expand the citizen component. I mean, it's kind of in a test situation right now with the no, um, widely, but we see in DC, they're also working on an app to let citizens submit um, idling complaints in DC. So it, it is a field that is growing and it's new and it's exciting as a lawyer to be kind of part of it as it's developing. Usually we end up with, we're stuck with a broken law and we're trying to fix it. We're actually developing the law and we can hopefully see this spread throughout the country. I mean, not all 50 states have idling laws today. I mean, some states have very lax idling laws. Um, New York City is one of the strongest. Even New York State's idling law is a lot more lax and it doesn't have a citizen component um, to idling. So I'm just going to add that one of the ones that I mentioned Kevin, in the beginning is yeah. um, Intro 149, and that is right now there's a law in the books that says citizens should be able to submit basically any kind of air pollution complaint, but right now there's no information about how that's actually being done. So one of the bills that Council Member 11 is working on right now is asking that that information be made public so that a similar thing can happen with more general air pollution that's not just idling. So there is some movement. Um, but I just want to get back really quickly. So once you take your video. Right. Once you take your video and document everything, um, then comes the documentation part, the complaint. This is the most important um, component. Because if you get something wrong, what's there's called a prima facie violation, which means you have to meet the elements of a crime in order for the case to be heard. This doesn't mean you win. This is just to get it in court. This is just so that the court will look at it and consider the evidence. Um, so there are a couple of key things you have to get. You have to have the right name of the operator of the vehicle. You have to document the location, document the time that they're idling. You have to document how long they're idling, at least three minutes. You have to say that they're idling for at least three minutes. Um, I had the type of device I was using, because I have heard that from the judges. Um, so you write that up in a, a complaint. I personally witnessed a truck owned by XY Trucking Company at the corner of you know Fifth and Lex, idling from 305 to 319, which is totally plausible. I've seen trucks for 30 minutes idling. I'm sure you guys have seen, have, have seen it. Um, and we, we have, we'll have a sample complaint written out um, to show you what you need. And then 
once you write out the facts of the case, then you also have to submit the evidence, which um, there's a website um, that you can search the US DOT number, which gives you their official um, filing with DOT, which tells you where they, um, what trucks they own, um, where they accept service, where their main office is located, um, where their mailing address, and all that information. I just take a screenshot from my um, computer, add it to the Word document that I'm creating that I'm going to submit. Um, I take pictures from the video if I haven't, or the picture that I've taken while recording the video of the license plates. Um, oh, you also, in the complaint, you also have to document New York City license plate and the number um, to identify the individual truck. And then you show a picture of the license plate. I usually try to get a good picture of the vehicle with a store or something that identifies the location. I'll show that picture of the side of the door showing the name and the DOT number. Um, and sometimes I'll add a Google map kind of of the location and you can put a little pinpoint on where you where the truck was. Um, and that just creates a three to four page document. I save it as a PDF um, for the complaint and I upload that to, um, to the website as I'm um, a lot of this information you also type in to the, the website. They'll ask you for the name of the company, the location, the time, and all of that. But you also get a written description of what you saw. And this is where you kind of put in your testimony. Um, so yeah, you want to get all of that information. And that's where you fill in. And I just cut and paste um, my complaint and put it in there. And it'll have all the information needed and then I also upload the file with the pictures and the complaint repeated and all that information. A couple question behind you first. Is the Word or the PDF document, is that absolutely essential? Yes. Oh, okay. It is. is it? It is, because that's the only thing that the court's going to keep. The video, as I said before, um, they get shown at court, but currently there's no way for both to keep it as part of the file that they keep. Um, in the old days, they would take like CDs and you, I guess DP could submit CDs or flash drives of the video, but probably nobody's gonna go back and watch that. And it's really only important if there's an appeal. If you lose and one, one side loses and they want to appeal, they'll want to rewatch the video. But the judge is most likely gonna just go back to the paper document if they have any questions as to the location or the um, license plate of the vehicle. Because if some, if the license plate says 546 and you write 589, you lost. That's it, it's over. You've identified the wrong vehicle. So you have to be very accurate in writing out your complaint. Um, you mentioned that you look or Google the company and the address. Is that a different address than the one that's, because every commercial truck needs to have that? company name and address on the vehicle. So I'm confused why you go and look that up. Some are illegible, some are wrong. Okay. I've had companies- So you gotta just to, to double check your yes. thing and then you just yeah. give them another. I want belt suspenders and you know paper safety clips. I don't, want to, I don't want any problem. I want everybody, when they see my complaint, they just pay it. That's the best. Best is when they don't challenge. They just say, oh, I'll just pay the fine. You know, thirty percent. Just pay the fine. Thirty percent win a court, and thirty percent lose a court. So, okay. but the default? Oh well, yeah. The faults are. I mean, I don't. I can't really count those. That's probably another five or ten percent. Um, that's just people who ignore the ticket. Um, they're good for you because then the well, well, fine goes up to a thousand dollars. But if they ignore the ticket, they probably are not going to pay it or will pay sometime way later when they find out that they had a, had a case. But in those cases, you got 250 instead of um, 350. But yeah, I mean, you want, the, you want a solid case so that they don't fight it and they just pay it. You get paid faster, you win more, it's a lot easier. And it has to match what's on the truck. Yes, and sometimes it's just illegible. These are old trucks, you can't really read the address. Or the name. I found, I found some where they actually have two numbers on them. Yeah. Perhaps the truck changed hands. Yeah. And, and no, that one didn't bring the old DOT number on the yeah. truck body or the DOT number on the board. And I've heard people just flat out say, that's not my truck. 
you know, that they've come in and they just said it's somebody else's truck. But that US DLT number, that's filed with the with the feds. You can't I mean you own that truck. If somebody stole your number, you need to go find them. Because I mean that could be serious consequences. Um, uh, let's talk question over here first. I don't know. Yeah. So you mentioned that if they don't pay the ticket, there's an escalating value to the ticket. Yes. Is there anything in the legislation that could be written in for repeat offenders? There yeah. is. There is already a repeat offenders, and that's very tricky. A lot of people think, um, oh, I call this truck Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I'm going to get, you know, three-time offender. I'm going to submit it all. It doesn't work that way. Um, you have to. I mean, you got to be a little sneaky on those. Um, if you want to get the second or third offense. And currently, there's no way of knowing if, you know, if George got a truck last week and I'm submitting the same truck, I don't know if, if that's a second offense currently. We're working to find a way that the, there is a way to know what's been filed and who filed it. Um, so that there, you know, even if it's a different person filing for that vehicle. Well, wouldn't the DOT the, know that this truck has been, it's the same license plate, the same DOT yeah. number? It's like, um, hey, truck got it last week and, and this week, and you know, yeah, the DP two knows. days in between. But, but the question is, is there an escalating value for repeat offenders? Yes, there is. But in order to get the second offense, they have to be found in violation before the second ticket is written. Mm -hmm. Sub submitted. Yeah, before you can submit the that's ticket. Right. So they have true. to already be found in violation because there's no notice. Mm -hmm. If they come in one day and have six tickets, you know, they lose the first one, you can't just say, oh, well, now you got a second offense, and then now you got a third offense. It, they're all treated as first offenses if they come in the same day with multiple tickets. They're all treated as first offense, because you're not, it's not a second offense until they're found in violation. And then you have two years since the first violation to then file the second, and then once they're found, the time starts when they're found in violation, not when it's written. So you have two years to make the second offense, and then you have another two years to make the third offense, and that's where it stops. Everyone after that is the same fine. So what's the escalating value of the first ticket? Is um, yeah, I think it's um, for the base, it's 445 and then 550. Um, default goes to like 2000. Um, so it, it, does, it does rank up a little bit. Um, so if you have the same truck, you have to file the first one, wait until that one's been adjudicated and then file the second one. Does it have to be the same person that does the filing? Or it doesn't have to be, but currently there's no way to check if someone okay. else has filed it. So um, I think they're working on a way as to, to notify you as to what's already been um, we're working filed. On that. We're working yeah, on that. we're working on trying to get that uh, to get a shared database or so that the computer will, when you're submitting it and you put in a license plate, it will scan its records. But they've just gone online this February. Um, so they're still working out the bugs. So now, that we have, now that we have a room full of videotapers, if I tape a truck and she tapes a truck and we both send it in, how does that work? In the same truck? Yeah. Um, same day. Same day. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got a bunch of videos. First one in. First one in wins. <laughs> um, but how long do you have to file a complaint? Forever. Okay. <laughs> if I have a video from a year ago, I can still submit that. Yes. Um, Technically, forever, the court will frown upon it the longer it goes. Um, but yeah, technically, there's no statute of limitations. These are administrative hearings. But it becomes harder to prove, you know, what happened on X day the further out it goes. And already, you know, you're filing today. Your case is probably not going to be heard until six months from now. Um, so yeah, the, the court will frown upon it. It's two years old. Uh, but if you have good video from two years ago and you remember it, you can try it. Um, I don't, but I yeah, I know. a few weeks is not a big deal. No, no, no. no. And it's going to take a little bit of the time because once you submit the complaint and the video, they're going to ask you for an affidavit. And um, that you have to, I mean, I I can, I ought to fill my affidavits um, as I'm filing and you get the complaint number. Um, then you kind of stop with the online and then you have to get a notary to sign the affidavit. Currently. Um, that's the that's what it's required to have an affidavit for each filing. Um, so you get a bunch of them, you submit them online, get the complaint numbers, fill out a bunch of affidavits. You can go to your bank or a local tax office, lawyer office, and it's fairly cheap, probably less than five dollars an affidavit. Um, if you're I get it for free. 
<laughs> I can do it. I'm an Apple order. Bank gives it for free. Yeah, if you have a bank account with a certain bank, most of them will Apple do it for free. Office also do it for free. Yeah. So there are places that you can get free notary service. Um, yeah, my bank does it for free. I'm so there is some actual paperwork. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There is some work, but I mean, I I gauge two hours start to finish everything, recording the video, making the complaint, submitting it online, getting the affidavit, getting paid, two hours per ticket. You're getting about forty dollars an hour on average. It's eighty-seven fifty, but yeah, here or there. Um, and then as you get better at it, it becomes easier, it becomes faster. They're autofill, you know, we'll have autofill forms that have most of it already laid out. Alright, so um, yeah. you said you submit your evidence. Yes. Um, and so you press submit and then they ask you for an affidavit or do you simply include it from the get-go? Yeah. Well, um, you can't really have the affidavit finished before you submit it because they ask you for the complaint number on the affidavit so they can track the affidavit with the submission. I also include the vehicle license plate, the name of the company, the US DOT number on it, so that they can track that this affidavit belongs with this complaint. Is um, there a prompt for it, or you just have to know? Yeah, it's a sep after you submit the complaint and the video, it goes and you submit it, and it goes to another page and it says submit the affidavit. But it, it holds it so that you can get all, you know, you can shut off the computer, days later okay. you come back, you find that file, you go back into it, and then um, you'll click through confirming you know, the other information. You submit, you upload the PDF of the affidavit, and um, then you can't do anything else. To them. Once you submit the affidavit, that's it, they lock you out. And then in about two or three weeks to two or three months, you'll get an email, DP has reviewed your submission, we will accept it and issue it to an officer. And then a couple weeks later, you'll get the actual, we have written the violation, your case is scheduled for X date and the violation number. And um, you can check that violation number on OLS database, which we'll have a link to also on the website. And you put in your violation number and it'll give you a, you can look at a copy of the actual ticket that the inspector wrote, and it should have your evidence along with it that they submit to court electronically. And they'll tell you when the date is, and then they'll, you know, you check back later and they'll tell you if it's been adjourned or if they paid it. And once they paid it, um, I print out, a, I do a PDF of the page that it's been paid, and also I keep a PDF of the DEP's letter that says, I submitted this violation. You email it to Oath with a simple line, you know, I submitted this violation, I would like to get paid now. Um, do you need to email Oath? Yes, they do not look for you. They do not care that you exist. Okay. They don't know that it's a citizen suit. I mean, the system is set up to do handle city violations. I mean, all of them, yeah, the, the administrative court system is set up for agencies to file complaints. So all the money goes to the Department of Finance. The agencies don't individually collect their penalties. So um, there's real, this is the only, well, it's not the only citizen's complaint. The other type you can do is um, smoke. You have to have gone to smoke school and be certified and trained. And I don't think, I, there's, there's like one or two people who have submitted citizen smokes violations. Um, but yeah, you don't get autumn. There's, if you're just sitting there waiting on the check, you're not gonna get it. Um, you do have to submit uh, documentation and tell them, mail it to X address, and they'll mail it to you. Um, I give you a sample of the letter with the stuff in the back over there, so it'll be yeah. a template. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real simple, and they're, they're usually pretty good. You, you don't usually get a return email, but you'll get the check usually within two to three weeks of submitting the documentation. Um, more questions? What about, it says here also weather app temperatures. Is that only for passenger buses? Yes, um, passenger buses require the temperature to be above 40 degrees for them to be uh, guilty of idling, and they also need to be a 15 passenger or more vehicle. Um, so buses are a little trickier, but well, most of the coach buses um, are the doesn't matter, as long as no one is getting on or off the bus. Oh, so people can't be on the bus? Yes, um, that's actually, it was a little confusing because the, the regulation that talks about bus references the VTL, which is a state law, and it says 
the buses may be occupied as long as no one's loading or unloading. Like, okay, so as long as they're sitting on the bus, that's fine, as long as no one is getting on or off of the bus during the time that you're recording. And it's above 40 degrees and the bus can hold 15 passengers. Usually they'll say on the side of the bus capacity um, X number, and you could include that um, in your description, but you don't have to. That is, the court has ruled that that is the burden of the bus company to say that the bus doesn't hold 15 people. Because, I mean, they're not gonna expect you to go on and count seats and be like, oh, I want to, you know. Um, so that's, as long as you say, and you should identify it's a bus versus a truck or a van. Um, There's a low temperature rule for diesel, all diesel vehicles, trucks as well. Do you want to this in the way? No. If it gets down to, I don't know, 15 degrees or something. Well, I wouldn't be out there reporting yeah. at 15 degrees. <laughs> but of course, I like, <laughs> I like the sun. I like Even if it's not, they might claim it. So if it gets really cold. That's not in the statute. In the actual 163, it only talks about buses and 40 so degrees. It's on the website. Yeah, but that, that's the edges that I, that I like to push. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a, uh, any sort of a difference with out-of-state out tags with a lot of out-of-state Out-of-state state is what you want. They're yeah. not coming back to fight the violation. They're like, <laughs> I got a violation in New York, oh, 350. I'm not coming back to, for a day in court. A lot of Connecticut, a lot of New Jersey, yeah. a lot of PA. Yeah. That's the sweet spot. Yeah. And, and, that, and, that's, and then I found that that is not a lie. That is where the vehicle is registered, but the companies can be anywhere. Companies could be a New York company. Um, one of the companies that I've found a few times, MV Transportation, it's out of Texas. Um, but they own the buses, they're the operator. Um, but they have New York tags. Um, they have accessoride vehicles, they have um, school buses, they have regular transit buses. So I guess they lease the buses to other companies, but they're the owner on the US DOT number. So these companies can be located anywhere. Companies in New York will register their vehicles for tax purposes or company filings in other states. But um, out-of-state license plates are probably better because they're not coming back to fight, fight the violation for $350. It's not worth it to them. Um, so out-of-state, it's, it's in New York. As long as they're in New York, you can get them. Yeah. I think conversely, I was reading about DOT numbers. And yeah. Is that only required for vehicles that cross state lines with commerce, and what do you do if there's no DOT yeah. It does, um, and if they carry certain types of equipment, like hazardous materials, maybe food, um, it does not hazardous, most of it is not um, You know, there's certain materials that you do require a US DOT number. Um, I think it's, the school buses have a DOT number, I think so. I'm not, I don't remember right now. Um, but yeah, there are um, certain, even in states, that require it. If they don't have it, then you can go to the um, Department of Corporations, Department of State, and you can do a name search, and it'll tell you who they're um, who they've authorized to accept service in the state. Usually, it's a lawyer or the head of the company, uh, but that's a legal address. So, if they don't have a U.S. DOT number, I'll usually search Department of State and um, put in the name, and it will search for that name, and it'll tell you where they can accept. That's service. like the name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are quite a few little nuances. That's why we're working on the online tutorial to get into some of the nitty gritty areas. And you know, you can talk to us on the Google form if you run into a question that you have. That um, we're, we don't want to leave you alone. Just give you a little bit of information and let you run out there. And then you're like a year later, none of these won. I mean, we don't want that. Um, we want you guys to effectively file. Yeah. Are you required to go to court for? If they don't get paid? Well, I mean, if they, if they don't just pay them right away, yeah. and they uh, challenge They want to challenge them. You can be required to go in court. Some people have appeared by phone. Mm -hmm. that, um, that has been allowed. Um, I don't know if the judges look less favorably on that or not, but you but are. you can't go to court. Yeah, you can't appear by phone. Is it a bad thing? Um, are you well, if you're being requested to go to court, then they're definitely contesting it. Okay. Um, so you can't make it. You can't make it. I mean, it's. Whether it's worth it or not, you, you can reschedule. Yeah, you can try and reschedule to a date that you're available. You know, I, mean, I think the inspectors reach out to you and let you know that, um, that your case has been rescheduled because they'll have your email address or your phone number for the filing. Um, 
But it's not an automatic loss, but it definitely means that they're challenging. And usually, if you have a company that has multiple violations, they'll put them all on the same day. So it might be worth it if you have five or six on the same day to appear. Um, but if you're, it's not worth it to you, don't show up. Let it ride. I mean, you're not going to get more money for showing up. And it it's not it's not, no. The, the administrative courts cannot subpoena anyone. They don't have the power to compel you to come to court. Um, they can request you to come, but it's, it's not, they can't issue a bench ticket or anything or a warrant um, to appear. It's, um, it's an informal request. Yeah. Um, yes? How like how likely is it that you would be called in to I've never had to testify. <laughs> I've never been called in. I've, but that's why you want a solid pack of evidence. The more solid your evidence is, the less likely you have to show up. Spend an extra 20 minutes at home watching TV and drilling it out will save you a day in court. <laughs> I mean, that's the way I look at it. You know, I don't submit videos that are you know two and a half minutes because even you know I might have seen the vehicle for four minutes, but. It Two and a half minutes on video, they have a, you know, they can weasel a lot of it. There is, it's less likely that it's going to be a winner. So that's why I try to go for four minutes. I go for the, you go for the easy ones. There are plenty of them, and Brooklyn is untapped. I mean, I don't think anyone is in Brooklyn really. A few, but not many. Yeah, I mean, I've found a few in Brooklyn. I go to all the different boroughs for work, so I'm in Brooklyn, I'm in Bronx, I'm in Queens. Um, so I get a few everywhere. Um, but, yeah, I mean, as far as the number of submissions, that, like I said before, 90% plus are in Manhattan. So I don't think a lot of the drivers in Brooklyn and the outer boroughs are aware that people are looking. It's not really an issue, but we want to make it an issue. Um, we hope that, you know, we get four or five times the number of complaints and then it drops off. Everybody just stops or they go electric or something happens, but I mean, the think more, of, you know, think of a bell curve, yeah. a bell curve like this. So right now we're a year and a half into this thing and we're ramping up great in terms of the numbers. At some point in the future, it's going to level off because the word's going to get out. People have been paying the fines and they're going to say, this is ridiculous to continue. I'll buy a start stop device for my car or I'll just not idle anymore. And then the tickets will start to go down. But it, as this goes down the bell curve, that's success. That's success that no other city in the, in the world, as far as I know, is doing to address this stupid problem of idling. You know, and, and the purpose of this gathering, as far as I'm concerned, besides giving you some tips and some nuance, is to give you confidence. I mean, it's not rocket science, but you gotta pay attention and do it, do it right. And if you do it right, you know, you'll be joining the ranks of Greta but AS16 is changing the world. And you guys are all adults. If she can do it at 16, and she's doing it, you guys can do it. And the program's been monetized for you to make money. I mean, it's, it's like gravy. And you're doing such a great thing for the city. Yeah, and I mean, if the city sees that it works on idling, we can get you know bike lanes or we can get you know people parked illegally and other types of violations. So, I mean, this is, you know, everybody talks about carbon taxing, will it work? Well, this is kind of a test of it. I mean, is there enough incentive that, or disincentive by people paying a violation for polluting? Um, and do citizens actually care about their environment? I mean, I think it sends us a larger message to the city council and to the agencies if they see that the citizens are actually getting active. I mean, that's part of the, the climate strike and everything. And, you know, demonstration is important, but we also need real solutions. I mean, the demonstration is great to get word out, but, you know, like Occupy Wall Street, I don't know what came out of it. I mean, I know it was a great demonstration and everything, but what was the practical changes that came out of that? Um, you know, and this is, this is crunch time, if you believe the science, um, this is what we really have to get on it and, you know, get off the gas, really, um, and do something else. So if they see that the citizens are not just yelling and screaming, but actually doing something 
progressive and you write to your, your council member and say, I believe that this is an important issue to me, and they see that you're actually taking the law into your own hands where you can, doing stuff legally, that you know will make a change. Then we can push other areas. You know, they'll see that, okay, this worked here. You know, the city's getting free money out of this too. I mean, they're their inspectors are, don't have to go out and police idling. They can police other things, and they're still getting 75% of these violations. So, you know, they can, you know, citizens on patrol, and, you know, a lot of you guys are probably old enough to, to get that reference. Um, but, you know, that's that's where we're, we could be headed, so they could offsource more of these types of violations. Yeah. Um, I saw the, uh, the playgrounds in the schools. Yes. The, Uh, independent park, no. Um, it has to be connected. The city park? No, but still three minutes. A playground in a park? What? A playground in a park? Um, it doesn't matter. It has, it's, it's, a, it's a school. But um, I'm glad you did say that. There is legislation. You, there is legislation currently that is semi circulating that something else um, that we're looking at. I mean, I'm kind of hyper-focused on the electric school bus bill right now, but as a broader, as we're talking about idling with other groups, there is legislation that's talking about nursing homes, homes of worship, um, other things that have been suggested, and there are a few sponsors, but it really hasn't gotten any traction. So, I mean, if they're, you know, just a city park, if that is an issue, you know, we can add that to the idling bill, we can make it one of the restricted areas that are one minute or less. Um, so that, I mean, that's why we need you guys. We need more people, more voices telling city council, you need to move. I mean, you always hear them say, we're with the kids protesting, we're, we're champions for the environment. But then when it comes down to the voting and the passing of the bills, it's a little quiet um, about the things that are important to, to different people. And the more voices they hear on different issues, the more they'll have to react. I mean, yeah. it, you know, George was one man in the beginning and he helped spearhead this. I mean, I started alone and I've, other groups have seen and we got, I mean, the bill is there, we're waiting for the vote, we've got the sponsors. So, it, I mean, one person who really cares about an issue, talking to the right people, can help bring it to the fore. That's a great segue. Yeah. Um, so we are going to continue to advocate on these issues, and now you're all on our email list, so you'll get to hear um, when we have actions. Um, and I just want to thank Tevin and George and Sarah for coming and sharing their experience with us. I know that share them, show the city how many vehicles are idling out there on a daily basis. Thanks again for watching. Please subscribe, comment, hit the notification bell, like and share to help our channel grow. And below you'll find links to our website evolveelectric.org, our Twitter and Instagram.